All right, well, good morning and uh, happy Father's Day to all you fathers out there. Uh, I don't know why, but Father's Day seems to be a little less exciting than Mother's Day. We don't have any flowers for you guys or anything. Sorry about that. Don't have flashlights, no knives or guns or anything cool or stakes for the rest of the year. Nothing fun like that. Um, but I really appreciate all you guys who I know are uh, in the thick of being a dad. And I think that in our culture, typically moms are looked at as like, oh, moms are the really special ones. And mothers, you are. You're amazing. Uh, but dads, I just want to just say thank you. Um, thank you for continuing to, to press on. Thanks for continuing to love your kids. And, and uh, I've just been really moved by the Lord this week to just think, okay, you know, what do I, what do I want my kids to see in my life? And, and I really want them to see that their dad loves Jesus and doesn't just love Jesus, but is worshiping Jesus. And so that would be my encouragement for all of you men here today is that as a Christian, your primary role is to be an example um, and you're going to be a bad example <laughs> of it. But praise God for that because in that, in your failures as a dad, Jesus will come right in and show your kids how amazing the gospel is. So I just want to encourage you men in that. Keep pressing. Keep fighting the good fight. And uh, I hope that you're encouraged today. I hope you go eat steak or do something really wonderful that men like to do. But I just wanted to, to pray for you guys and pray for our time in Romans this morning. So let's pray together. Oh Lord, I do thank you for the men in this church who have the wonderful opportunity to be fathers. And uh, I would just ask God that you would help them in their weakness to uh, be supported by this church that you would help them uh, to find their strengths that you've given them, that you've, every, every man in here, every woman in here has been given gifts by you, God, to do amazing things for the sake of your kingdom. And I would just ask, Father, that you would bear much fruit in the lives of the fathers of this church. I pray, God, that the root would be sound so that the fruit would be healthy. So I, I would just ask, God, that even through this message today that has nothing to do with fathers, really, um, that we would behold our Heavenly Father all the more and see you as our example, see you as our great King and our great God and our great Father who loves us more than we could possibly even understand or think. Um, so God bless this time in Romans. This is going to be a whirlwind, Father. And I would just ask that somehow, by your grace, you would, you would show us the truth behind this passage this morning. Amen. All right. You guys ready to get to work? I'm not kidding when I say this is going to be like a whirlwind. This is going to be like a fire hose. So get out your Bibles, get a pen, get paper, whatever you need to stay focused, or else you're going to derail really fast. And I'm, I'm just going to warn you, this passage is one of the more confusing passages in the history of interpretation of Scripture. And uh, I'm not even going to tell you at the end what I think the answer is. I'm just going to throw out all the different options, and you, I'm expecting that you're going to go actually study the Bible this week and look into it yourselves. Um, but we're in Romans 7, starting in verse 13. And let's uh, read the whole thing together, and then uh, we'll go verse by verse. So Paul says this, Did that which is good, speaking of the law, then bring death to me? By no means, it was sin producing death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what's right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So, I find it to be a law, <clears throat> excuse me, that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? 
Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. So Paul's aim in chapter 7 is found in this, uh, in verse 13 specifically. Okay, that's kind of what he's been doing this whole time, given all he's said about the law. Is it evil? Is it the cause of death? Is that what destroys us? And as he said many times before, by no means. It's sin. Sin is what destroys us. Sin is what conquers us. Sin is what causes us all this problem. Sin took the law, which is good, and used it to produce sinfulness in us. That's what he's been saying all along. And that's what we talked about last week. And the law is not the enemy. Basically, the sin is the enemy. Okay? However, we also understand that God's law, like the Ten Commandments, for instance, uh, cannot and will not save us, uh, primarily because we cannot live up to them. It's too much for us. So this is, again, Paul's premise for all these verses. And so I don't want to miss the forest for the trees, as it were, and get really too focused, although we're going to this morning, on really what is not even the main point of the passage, which is that the law cannot save us and only Christ can save us. Okay, so from verse 14 onward, we're really going to have to wrestle with this text to try to decipher what Paul's trying to communicate, and I'm not kidding. We're going to be wrestling a lot. Um, he's speaking, is he, so there's some questions. Is he speaking of himself in a pre-conversion state? That's one view. Is he speaking of himself as he experiences life, like this is the normal Christian life, and he's giving us an example of that? Uh, or is it something else entirely <laughs> that he's doing in this section? Okay, so... You can see why it might be a little confusing, but we're going to look through each verse first and then kind of try to do an overall summary of, of what the point is at the end. So verse 14, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh sold under sin. So one of the questions that has been posed about this section is if Paul is actually referring to himself or if he's referring to a hypothetical individual. Now let's begin by analyzing the verse itself. Okay, so Paul says that the law is spiritual. Let's start there. So what does that mean? Well, if we look at the Ten Commandments, we see what we're supposed to do and what we're not supposed to do, right? That's kind of how everybody takes the commandments. It, it tells us what we're not to do and what we are to do. But that's not all, is it? No, it's not. It, there, there's more to the law. There's more to the law. The, you know, the law does not exist for us to simply follow it without it affecting or changing us. It's meant to do something to our heart. It's meant to reveal something to us about our heart. So the law is more than the letter. It's, it's deeper than the words on the page. So when someone says, you know, I followed those instructions to the letter, they mean that they went step one to step two, step three, step four, and they didn't leave it at all. They totally just did every little detail of the instructions. Most of you probably don't put things together that way. But that's typically when you get something and you build it, you're following it in every instruction. So that person would say, you know, I followed it to a T. And that's actually how the Pharisees felt about the law. They saw what it said and they wanted to follow it to the letter. All the while forgetting that it was supposed to affect their heart. They didn't see that it was actually a spiritual thing. That it wasn't just something they were supposed to follow kind of without thinking about it. And again, its goal, the goal of the law is to reveal our inner thoughts and desires and to hold them against the character and the will of God. That's the whole point of the law. And Paul uses this language in 2 Corinthians 3, 4 through 6, where he says, such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. And notice how Paul's argument is the same here that he had talked about before. It, you know, that the law proved to be death to me. It wasn't the law that brought about death. It wasn't necessarily the letter that ultimately killed me, but sin abused that and used that to bring me to this state where all of a sudden, wow, I feel dead. I'm not, I don't feel as alive as I did before. The law is revealing all these things about me. So let's go back to verse 14. That, we're not confused yet. Hopefully we're going to be. So hold on tight. Okay, verse 14, now he says, but I am of the flesh sold under sin. Okay, so as I said before, here we run into our first difficulty. The challenge of this section is the way in which it's written. From a play and reading, what would we see here? Well, first, it's autobiographical, right? Paul's referring to himself by using the words I, my, me in these verses. Well, second, he seems to be speaking in the present tense. So this is something he's experiencing currently. And it's because of these two observations that many believe this to be Paul 
showing the Romans his normal Christian experience at the time of writing the letter. But is this the case? Well, we have to look at what he's saying here and see if it meshes up with what he said at other places in Scripture. You know, he says here that he's of the flesh, sold under sin. Is Paul contradicting what he said earlier in Romans 7? Verse 4, where he says, like my bro- Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Notice the past tense here. While we were living in the flesh, but now... It would seem that Paul's already shown that we're no longer in the flesh, right? That's something that's past. So if that's the case, then wouldn't it stand to reason that Paul's talking about himself prior to conversion? It wouldn't make sense for him to be talking about himself now. Well, he also says that he's sold under sin. Well, how could he say this when he already said in Romans 6, 16 through 18, do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness." Notice again the use of the past tense here. You were slaves of sin, but now have become slaves of righteousness. So to be sold under sin would mean that you were enslaved to it, wouldn't it? Do you see why this passage is starting to get confusing and difficult? Are you having fun yet? I hope so. By verse 14 alone, it would seem to make more sense that Paul is referring to a person that's not saved, but still living under the law. Now, those who believe that this is Paul speaking of his Christian experience would quickly say it's not meant to show a common state of the Christian since a Christian cannot possibly be sold under sin permanently. There are moments when a Christian does give themselves over to the flesh and does give themselves over to slavery to sin, but they would propose that that's a temporary state, not a permanent state, not something that they continue to struggle with. And we can see that as a possibility in the verses we just read in Romans 6. If, if he has to warn us You know, don't present yourselves. You know, you have the opportunity to present yourself to A or B. Don't do that. If he he has to say that, then doesn't it stand to reason that we can, in fact, present ourselves to sin at times? And that we can obey sin because it deceives us when we should be in righteousness. Now, the pre-conversion camp, the people that would believe that this is a pre-conversion Paul or someone who's not yet saved, would quickly come back and say that Paul doesn't give us this distinction in Romans 7. He doesn't make a point to say that it's temporary, but that he is of the flesh, sold under sin. On the other hand, however, how would a person who has yet to be saved know that they are of the flesh and that sin is a problem? How would someone who's pre-conversion, pre-coming to Christ, possibly know that, they, that this is even a problem, that sin's even a problem? You know, a Jew would have known the law, but because of their good deeds, they almost certainly would have not said that they were terrible sinners. They would have held themselves in high regard because they followed the law. So an unregenerate person, and I'm going to use two terms this morning. I'm going to use the term regenerate and unregenerate. Unregenerate meaning someone who has not yet been saved by Christ and been redeemed, and regenerate being someone who has come to Christ. So I just want to, I'm going to use those words a lot and I want to make sure that you guys are tracking with me there, okay? It's not complicated, but regenerate, just regeneration. Something comes to life, okay? That's what that means. So an unregenerate person wouldn't say such things. So it seems that even one verse in, <laughs> we've reached a problem, haven't we? One verse in, the person here doesn't seem to be unregenerate or regenerate. What on earth are they? Who is this person? What is going on here? You know, and, and it's possible that this is this Could it be Paul? Is it someone else? And it's important to remember as we dig through this not to interpret scripture based on one verse alone. That's how how cults happen. So we want to make sure that as we're looking at this, we keep following his train of thought and we don't just camp on this and say, oh, well, this is what this means. So we're going to keep moving. Verse 15, hopefully Paul will clear himself up. For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want. 
but I do the very thing I hate. So this person looks at their life and their actions and they say, ah, why am I doing this? Why am I living this way? They don't understand, it makes no sense to them. They see good and they wanna do it, but they keep doing evil. Importantly, this, this person hates what they're doing. They just don't know that it's bad. They actually despise it inside themselves. You know, they, they don't just think it's wrong, they hate it. So can a person who is still under the law, living the life like Paul was, unaware of the reality of sin in their own lives, say such a thing? Could someone who's not yet saved even say such a thing? Is it even possible for an unregenerate person to think that way at all? To know what's wrong and to hate what's evil? Is that even possible? Well, certainly you could say that a law-abiding Jew would hate things that were opposed to God's law But it wasn't typical for them to be so introspective about their own spot, their own place, their own reality. And if this is an unregenerate person, or excuse me, if this is a regenerate person, I'm gonna try not to mix this up. That would be really bad if I said the wrong word. Uh, If this is a regenerate person, someone who's already saved, one who's already been redeemed by God, this could make a little more sense. This is a person who sees sin in their life. They hate it. They actually despise it. And in their wrestle against sin, they've kind of lost the battle. And they've fallen into sin. They have in a moment become obedient to sin or temporary, temporarily sold to it. But there's a certain attitude of defeat in this passage that we want to be aware of as well. You know, we may read this verse and say, well, that sounds like my experience. And you'd be right to think that way. But is that the, then the end-all, be-all interpretation? Do we just interpret the Bible based off of our own experience? Well, that's the way I experience life, so that must be what the Bible's saying. Of course we don't do that. Of course we don't interpret the Bible totally based on our own experience. Well, this is how my life is, and so I guess the Bible needs to fit that paradigm. We can't interpret scripture that, scripture that way. So, let's keep going. Verse 16. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. Hey, a statement that's not confusing. This is so nice. Thank you, Paul. You know, this is a person that realizes that if they give in to doing what they view as wrong, the law is actually good in pointing out to them that they had did something wrong. Hey, the law was right, so it must be good. Like a person who says, I really want to murder somebody. I know this is really extreme, but just want to make sure you're listening, okay? So a person who says, hey, I want to murder somebody, and they, they know that they shouldn't, but they do it anyway. Well, at that point, hopefully they realize in the doing of it, that wow, the law was right because I just killed somebody and obviously it affected the world and things are wrong. So yeah, the law says not to do that. There's a reason that the law exists. It's good, it's good. And this is really Paul just putting in a little tiny sentence here to remind us of what the whole passage is really about. And that's that the law is good, that the law is helpful and that it points out to us that we are sinners when we do what we do not want. So he continues on, verse 17. So now it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. And this verse can be dangerous if handled incorrectly. You know, upon reading this verse, someone could say, they could draw the conclusion that when they sin, it's not actually them sinning, it's just sin. I'm I'm not responsible for my sin. Sin's just happening to me. You know, like the devil made me do it argument, right? I didn't really do anything wrong. It's just sin dwelling in me and sin made it happen. Well, you got to remember that, you know, sin is the driver and you're the vehicle and you're still functioning. You're still a human being. Your body's still moving. If you choose to kill somebody, you're still responsible for that. It's not like you just woke up on a Tuesday morning and happened to kill somebody by accident. Well, that happened by accident, but just murdered somebody where it's like an intentional, you went and just woke up and thoughts didn't even cross your mind, sin just took over and next time somebody was dead. Nobody thinks that way. We have no reason to believe by scripture that, that we operate that way or that God or that sin operates that way. But, you know, we, it'd be easy to fall into this line of thinking because it says it's no longer I, but sin that dwells within me. And really what I think Paul's trying to say here is that we cannot forget the power of sin. We just cannot forget the power of sin. It, it literally can, can take over enough to where it can cause us to do things that we wouldn't normally do or wouldn't want to do. You know, 
it causes so many problems in our world from corrupt governments to mass shootings to marital infidelity and everything in between. Sin is a problem, you guys. Sin is the problem. And, you know, we try to focus on the rotten fruit all the time, right? What's the behavior? What's, what's going on at the surface? We try to focus on the rotten fruit, and we try to fix that. But if we don't tend to the roots, the fruit's never going to be healthy. And if, in, if at the root, sin is just ravaging that tree, the fruit is never going to be healthy. So we have, to, we have to look at what's the root. The root problem is sin, and the world does not understand this. They try to change behavior. They try to regulate things. They try to enact new laws, trying to change all this stuff. But the problem is sin itself. Mankind does not want to see it. They don't believe it. And honestly, when you look at the world, the world has forgotten that there is even a thing called sin that is the reason we're here. That's why people ask the question, you know, oh, how could a good God, you know, allow suffering? I don't believe, and it's like, do you remember what we did in the garden? This isn't God's fault. <laughs> Try to, stop trying to put it on God. This is our fault. No, God's evil, God's bad. No, 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 he was so good. He's walking with us in the garden. Everything was sweet, and we screwed it all up. No, I don't want to admit that. that we, have, we have blinded ourselves even more than we already are to how powerful sin is. It's in the world and it's in man. So think about how difficult even as an example, as an illustration, think of how difficult this passage already is to understand. (laughs) Are you gonna blame God for that? Would you ever run across a verse or something when you're quiet time and you say, gosh, this doesn't make sense. God, why'd you have to put this in the Bible? That's an improper response. God's not the problem. Sin messed this all up so that we're confused by the Bible. Isn't that interesting? So as you sit here and you feel all confused, and you're like, what on earth is Paul even talking about? I lost him like 10 minutes ago and, you know, wins lunch. I hope you're not thinking that way. But this is fun, right? This is fun. We're getting to know scripture. I'm trying to show you guys how to tear scripture apart and how to build it back up again. And how to, It's really fun. This is what I get to do for a living. Isn't that cool? Anyway, when you can't seem to understand something in the word of God, don't blame him for it. Don't just throw your hands up, you know, we need to look at it and we say, what is it trying to say? Well, Paul's trying to say indwelling sin exists in the world and we need to be careful about it. We need to fight it. So, how does indwelling sin even work in a person? And is this, is this something that a mature believer would say? Would Paul actually say that sentence? And it, I just want to point out, it would seem impossible, again, for an unregenerate person to say what Paul says here. How on earth, without the work of the Spirit, could a person acknowledge their sin? They can't. We just know that, that people don't acknowledge their sin uh, without the Holy Spirit actually showing them that they're a sinner. Uh, verse 18, let's keep going. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what's right, but not the ability to carry it out. Okay, Paul, me- Paul makes a really important distinction here. There is nothing good within me. And then he clarifies, in my flesh. So there's nothing good in me that is in my flesh. So there appears to be kind of this duality of sorts within this one person. There's the flesh, that's one aspect of the person, and in that flesh, nothing good exists. There's nothing good in it. And he explains how this works in practice. You know, I have the desire to do good, to do good but I don't have the ability to carry it out. So what an interesting statement that is. Again, I don't find it to be possible for an unregenerate person, someone who has yet to be redeemed, to make this statement. Not according to what Paul said before about himself prior to conversion. Remember, he didn't have this concept of himself at all. He was living the life. He was a Pharisee. He was Hebrew of Hebrews. Everything was solid and good. You know, he thought himself blameless before God because he followed the law. He didn't see that nothing good was in him until after he had been saved by God through Christ. Do you see it? But then we run into a problem in the second half of the verse. So just when you think everything's fine, now... Dun, dun, we're back. More, more challenge, okay? This person states that they want to do good, but they can't. They seem to, it seems to be impossible for them. They lack the ability. And we really have to be careful here in what this means. When he says he wants to do good, he wants to do good, but he doesn't have the ability. Does this mean that he doesn't have any ability at all to do anything good? that it's really impossible for him completely, if he's saying this, then surely he cannot be a Christian. 
I don't have the ability to do any good at all. Even when I see good, I can't do it. That person cannot possibly be a Christian to say that. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I say that because we know that the Spirit makes, us, makes it possible for us to do actual good that glorifies God. No Christian would in good conscience say that they have no ability to choose good over evil. That would be to negate what Christ has done in your life. You do have the ability to do good. Imagine you're at two doors. One's already unlocked and the other is locked. Okay? The unlocked door has always been unlocked for you. And it leads to doing things that are sinful, opposed to God. The door on the right, the locked door, is good choices that glorify God. If the door on the right is locked, you don't have the ability to do those good things. You only have the ability to go through the other door. You don't have the key to that door. There's no possible way you can do good. You don't have any ability, like I said, to do good that brings honor to God. And a Christian has been given the key to the locked door and has the ability to do good for God. They may choose the door on the left from time to time, but their heart's desire and the key, that ability that God's given them, allows them to enter the door on the right. And this is what it would be like for a person if the ability that Paul's talking about is in regards to the whole person. But what if Paul isn't talking about the whole person here, but only referring to the flesh? He says, nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. So, if my flesh is rotten, and the only good thing about me is the Spirit of God at work in me, then my, in my flesh, I don't have the ability to do good in and of myself. I can only do good because of God, but my flesh, left to itself, can't produce good whatsoever. Does that kind of make any sense whatsoever? I hope so. Stay awake. Keep track of me. This is fun, I promise. You know, depending on how we interpret this, it could be easy for a believer to resonate with the first part of the verse. Of course there's nothing good in me. It's in my flesh. I think we can all say that's true. You know, given over to myself, I do all sorts of bad things. Even my motives would probably be wrong in the end. And as Christians, this does sound like our experience. And yet Paul throws in this second part when if we view it as the whole person, brings about a different conclusion. When we look at this, this person is defeated. They're at a loss. They cannot win. Indwelling sin is too much for them. So could this be Paul talking, if that's the case? Could he really say this about himself or about believers in general, that they can't do good because sin is too powerful and they can't possibly win? Would Paul really be saying that about himself? Again, we are kind of divided depending on how we interpret it. Where are we? Let's keep going. Let's keep going. This is fun for me. I'm really enjoying this. Verse 19. I didn't enjoy the study. That was a pain, but this is fun. Verse 19. Again. Okay, look. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Okay, this is a frustrating statement if the person is in a state of defeat. I want to do good, but I keep doing evil instead. They can't seem to stop. This is a reoccurring problem. This isn't just a one-shot moment of sin. This is a pattern of sin that they can't overcome. Now, we know that as Christians that sin is within us. We know that sin can overcome us at times and can make us feel as if we are without hope. But the question that I want to ask all of you and I'm going to try and flesh it out a little bit later, but are we ever really without hope as believers, as this man seems to be? Are we ever really totally defeated, ever totally really without hope? This person seems to have lost the battle so many times, and they seem hopeless. Is that really the normal Christian life? Is that the everyday Christian life? Is that how we should feel? Is that what Paul's trying to get across to us here? Is he saying, listen, I struggle with sin too, so you guys are good? I don't think so. At least, <clears throat> you know, he hasn't said anything along those lines yet. So let's just keep going. Thus far, if, if, if Paul is referring to his own struggle, he has possibly shown that he doesn't have the ability to defeat sin that is within him and that it keeps on winning. He can't actually beat sin. But we know that Paul doesn't view sin this way. Doesn't it sound weird to talk about Paul that way? We know that Paul doesn't view sin this way as like a total defeat for him. But then again, 
just to talk about the unregenerate person, would a person without Christ even be thinking about these things? No. Are you confused yet? This kind of feels like, have you guys seen The Princess Bride? Who's seen The Princess Bride? Okay, I almost brought a clip, but I'm not a clip person. So just go YouTube it yourself. Because clips always break, they don't work. I was surprised the lock for water thing worked. But um, in Princess Bride, you know, it's this really funny movie. But the man in black, Wesley, who's kind of the hero, is having a battle of wits with Bassini, this kind of short, really funny guy who's really annoying, actually, in a lot of ways. And they're having this battle of wits, and they're sitting there, and Wesley says, okay, we're going to have a battle of wits to the death. And he puts iocane powder, which is this poison, into one of the cups. He puts it behind his back and puts powder in there and brings it out, and Vicini kind of laughs. Ha, <laughs> you know, I'm so much smarter than you. And you remember that part where Vicini starts this monologue where he's like, well, because of this and this and this, I clearly can't choose the wine in front of me. And because of this and this and this, I clearly cannot choose the wine in front of you. And he's like you surely have a dizzying intellect. And he's like, wait till I get going. And then he keeps going. I surely cannot choose the wine in front of me. I surely cannot choose the wine in front of you. He does this three times. Doesn't this feel like that? Or it's like, well, it can't be an unregenerate person. And it certainly cannot be a regenerate person. Well, who is this person? Who is this? Hopefully this doesn't feel like poison to you, by the way. Like you're like, I wish I didn't come to church. Keep tracking with me. Okay, Paul's gonna continue his thoughts. So let's just keep going. Let's keep plowing through. Romans 7.20, now, if I do what I do not want, it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. He already talked about this in verse, 20, or in, uh, verse 17, so let's just keep going. So, I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. Now, Paul's beginning to conclude his previous statements here with an analysis of what he's already uh, said up to this point. So, based on what's going on inside this person, there's a law being revealed that is governing what's going on here. And this isn't a law in regards to the Mosaic law. This is more of a, a principle. Like think of it like a scientific law, like the law of third, thermodynamics or laws of physics or something like that, where you test them and you test them and you test them and they come back with the same result, same, same circumstance. Think of it more like that kind of a law. Now he's finding that when he wants to do right, the result is always the same. Evil is always there. I want to do right, but evil lies close at hand. His desire is to do good, but sin is ever-present, trying to get him to take that door on the left instead of the door on the right. And as Christians, doesn't this verse seem so real to us? Doesn't this feel like our experience? You know, we're daily under the bombardment of opportunities to sin. In this fallen world, brothers and sisters, this, this war does not end in this life. There are no vacations in this war against sin. You don't get time off. There's no PTO, you know. Oh, I put in a lot of prayers, so I get 10 days off this year, right? I don't have to fight sin. It doesn't work that way. Sin is always fighting to defeat you and destroy you so that you forget how great God is. That's the fallen world we live in. There are no breaks. So stop taking breaks. What's the, what's the line? I think it's John Owen. He says, be killing sin or it will be killing you. Is that the coolest quote? John Owen's solid gold. Just check him out. But anyway, this verse is really real, real to us. And this, this is most likely one of the verses that leads so many people to think of this passage as the normal Christian experience, and rightly so. However, for a person who is without Christ, they would not seem to care about these things, right? An unregenerate person wouldn't give a rip. You know, this would not be an evaluation that they would make, that evil lies close at hand, and sin is always at the door. They wouldn't even think that way. But maybe Paul's going to throw a hurdle at us again. Let's keep going. 7, uh, 722 and 23. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. So before we talk about the delight in the law of God part, we need to address Paul's referring to his inner being. All that means is basically anything other than the flesh. So his mind, his soul, his heart, all that kind of stuff, that, that kind of inner soul that he's referring to. And this is one person, one nature. This isn't two people with two natures. This is one person, one nature. But there is this duality between the flesh and the mind or the inner being that we have to look at. So in his mind, he delights in God's law. So again, can we say that a completely unregenerate person would say such a thing? That yeah, I love God's law. It's so wonderful. 
You know, there are those in the camp that believe that this person is unbeliever who would say that Jews did in fact delight in the law of God. That it doesn't require a person to be saved by the Spirit of God for them to delight in God's law. And we do know that David wrote in Psalm 1, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in what? In the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. But an important thing to note that David was not a Pharisee. He did love God, and he was very sorrowful over sin when sin came and came into his life. So he, he wasn't looking at it the way a Pharisee would have looked at it, where a Pharisee would have said, yeah, I'm not like other men. I'm solid. I'm not like these sinners over here. David didn't function that way, especially after what happened with Bathsheba. And regardless, so this is a person that delights in God's law. He enjoys it. He thinks it's wonderful and good. However, in his members or in his flesh, there's another law at work, the law of sin. And these two laws appear to be opposed to each other. So remember when they said that the law must be evil, since you're talking all this stuff about the law and how it's like sin? Well, again, he's pointing out law and sin are separate. They're two different things. And again, an unregenerate person would not be aware of this battle. However, Christian surely is. And time and time again, we know the good we ought to do, don't we? We know the good thing that we ought to do, and yet our flesh wins out when we sin against God. And the only way we know this is because we recognize that the law is good and what God has shown us about ourselves in the law. Now, the only question I have about this verse that makes it a little confusing is when he says, making me captive. Is it possible that a Christian can be made captive to sin that dwells within us. We know that sin affects us and confounds us at times, but are we as believers ever captive to it, like enslaved to it? Paul said in chapter six, we are no longer slaves to sin. We are slaves of righteousness. So how is it that we can consider ourselves captive at times, and how could Paul make this statement about himself? When elsewhere he speaks of our new freedom in Christ and and liberty through Christ and all these things. Now I realize full well that I'm asking more questions than I'm answering. I, I totally understand that. And I'm kind of doing that on purpose. One reason is because I don't have all the answers. You know, I don't. Don't expect me to have all the answers. I have a couple. <laughs> But, but this is what we do as Christians. We look at God's word and we study it and we ask questions of it and we try to figure out what on earth this means for our life. You know, I, I don't think that we can reason sense out of this text necessarily. We, we really do need the Holy Spirit to guide us. But it's important not to just take it at face value and to ask tons of questions. And honestly, guys, when you reach a passage like this or you reach stuff like this, please don't throw your arms up and say, eh, This doesn't make any difference. This is no big deal. God did not mean for us to stop digging for gold just because it's confusing to us. He knows our limits. He knows our limits better than we are, but the Holy Spirit will hopefully help us to find some sense in this. Okay. So I'm going to try not to go like two hours on this. This could have been like four talks, by the way. Um. But before we move into the final verses here, there's something important that we need to consider about this passage. The whole time we've been looking at whether this is the normal Christian experience or whether it's an unbeliever. Um, We've been trying to assess if this is Paul speaking or if he's talking about someone metaphorically using present tense and autobiography for dramatic reasons, which people often did. Um, And I don't think we've reached a conclusion on much of any of that. I apologize. But... Um, we need to consider the timing of this, the, the context of it. Paul's just been talking about the law and, and how we can't be saved by the law. And then all of a sudden he goes into an autobiography about, that, about his struggle with sin as a believer. That's a little out of context. It seems that way anyway. So we just need to think about the timing and think about the timing in regards to is this, the, is this the normal Christian life? This is the way it always is or is this a temporary thing? Are these temporary moments? And we're going to look at that at the end as, as well as we can. So let's continue on to the last two verses, verses 24 and 25. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God 
through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. These two verses are the ones that Christians have come back to time and time again as a help when sin won't seem to go away and we feel defeated. When we struggle with sin that won't go away, we look at verse 24 and we say with Paul, yes, I am wretched. I am a wicked person. I'm a worm. I'm I'm horrible in every way. I stink because I'm such a sinner and I can't get it right. Now the word wretched can also mean afflicted, miserable, brought to the total end, you know, despairing. And so this person seems like in a way that they're reaching a point of despair. They've reached the end of their rope and they don't have any peace right now. They see their sin and they're beside themselves. Then this person cries out, who's going to deliver me from this? He's in captivity. So what's interesting about verse 24 is the place of defeat that this person's in. They cannot look for help in themselves because the law has shown them that they can't do good enough to save themselves. So they're at a spot where they're saying, who's going to help me? I can't do it on my own. They see their sin, they're besides themselves. And when, they, when that person cries out, who's gonna deliver me from the body of death? They're in captivity. They can't seem to beat that sin that's winning the war at every turn. So they cry out because sin's too much for them. The laws condemn them, they're finished. So they just help. And the interesting thing about this is that this person doesn't know who will help them. Why didn't Paul just say, wretched man that I am, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. If this is the normal Christian experience, why didn't he just say, I am wicked, but thanks be to God. Why does he throw in this phrase, who is going to deliver me? Who is going to help me? Would Paul at this point in his Christian life have have wondered who is going to save him from sin? Would he have been in such a despairing position? Now we know that Paul referred to himself as the chief of sinners, but outside of that, what do we see him write about himself and his position every other place? You know, in his normal, is his normal Christian life every day, is his normal Christian life like the man that we just looked at in the previous verses? Is that how Paul talks about himself? Is that how Paul lives? You know, being overwhelmed by sin to the point of being afraid of what's going to happen. Who's going to help me? Is that really Paul? You know, and perhaps this is why he immediately falls with, follows with the statement, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, in our battle with sin as believers, there is really only one hope, you guys. There is only one hope, and that is that sin was paid for and death was defeated in the cross and in Jesus' resurrection. That's our only hope. So with that in mind, it would have been absolutely right for Paul and for us, for that matter, to yell out to God when we're struggling with sin, thank you. You are my only hope. Thank you. I can't beat sin on my own. So it would make sense. But still, would Paul have asked this question? It would seem that he knew who his Savior was. He didn't doubt the one that was going to bring him to the end. If he's talking about his normal Christian experience, every day I'm asking the question, who's going to deliver me? You know, at the end of his life, what did Paul say? He said, I fought the good fight. I fought it. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. He wasn't wondering what's going to happen. Who's going to save me? That wasn't in his mind. He had confidence in Christ. So, whether this is Paul or not, we can't look at this moment as a perfect example of what the everyday normal Christian life looks like because we know, we know who saved us. We should never ask this question as Christians. We may ask the question, where are you, Lord? Why, where are you? Why have you abandoned me? But we should never ask the question, who's going to save me? Who's going to deliver me? You're probably thinking, well, yeah, that's why he said in verse 25, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the answer. And yes, he did say that. 
But after all we've looked at, I'm still not totally convinced that this person's Paul. Or, you know, I don't know who it is, it may be Paul. But if you look at who this person is, I mean, look at who they are. He's of the flesh, sold under sin. He doesn't understand why he sins when he would rather do good. He doesn't get it. He has a desire to do good, but he can't necessarily do it. He wants to do good, but he keeps doing evil. He delights in the law of God, but he's held captive under sin in his flesh. He thinks that he's a wretched person, and he wonders, who's going to deliver me? And finally, he serves the law of God and the law of sin. Now, I don't know you, you, about you, but something about that doesn't seem right. And it may be fine, and I may be splitting hairs, but something just doesn't seem right. And as I already said, I certainly don't believe that this man is a full-blown unbeliever. I'm willing to accept that he may be a believer, but there's a third option as well that I want to throw out to you guys that I haven't mentioned at all, but I just want to throw it out. It's not very popular, but I find it to be somewhat compelling and, and interesting. Wouldn't it be possible that this person could be an unregenerate person who is beginning to see that they are wicked, the Holy Spirit's at work in their life, and they're beginning to see that they are actually wicked and that they've sinned against God and they need someone to rescue them? Think about what Paul's been talking about in, in Romans 7 before this. He's talking about how the law is not good enough. You can't save yourself by the law. And then all of a sudden there's this autobiography, and he's talking about, you know, wretched man, who's going to deliver me? In Romans 8 is the, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Is this just a transition? Is this just a transition? You know, who will deliver me? God is the deliverer. That's the answer. So again, while this isn't the most popular view, this person very well could be Paul's example of a person just prior to conversion. The Spirit has revealed who they really are, yet they don't know that Christ is the answer yet. They haven't believed on him, even though they know that they need help. Even though they totally know that they need help. And as we look at experience in light of those verses, that makes sense. Typically when someone's come, someone comes to faith in Christ, is they're totally oblivious, <laughs> The Spirit works in their life to bring about a knowledge of sin. They ask, where does my help come from? And the answer is Jesus, and they're saved. Now again, it's not a popular view, but I just wanted to throw that out for consideration. And honestly, guys, I don't know what the answer is. I could lean a certain way, but I'm not going to tell you again where I lean. You can ask me about it later. Um, but in the end, none of these views are the actual point. The main point is that sin is the enemy. Law is good. It confounds us. It, it, the, the sin just messes with us and that we, we cannot be saved through the law. That's what this person is dealing with. I can't be justified by the law by following it. I can't be sanctified by it. So just real quick, you might be asking, why did we just spend 47 minutes talking about these three views if you're saying that's not even the point? Well, because they do actually matter. What you think about this verse actually matters. So let's, if you take the unregenerate view, you know, this doesn't describe your Christian experience. This is just some person prior to Christ. The total unbeliever. You know, first you have to understand, this view was held by the church fathers, no question. So the early church, not like the New Testament church, but the early church, they all held to this belief that this was an unregenerate person. And it wasn't until Augustine came along, Augustine actually believed that it was an unregenerate person, but he changed his mind. But most of the church, early church fathers believed that this was an unregenerate person. Plus, the view does fit in the context of what Paul's been saying in chapters 6 and 7. But there's quite a few problems that we've already talked about. Why is this in the first person? Why is, why is this in the present tense if it's about a past person? And without a Holy Spirit, I don't even see how it's possible for this person to think all these things about themselves. When you go through it. So I, I'm not as convinced about that view. Well, what about the middle ground view? Oh, and by the way, if you were to believe that unregenerate view and you were to look at it, you might come to the conclusion that Christians never sin because this is just something that the unregenerate struggle with and that would be incredibly dangerous. There is no perfectionism in this life in regards to sinless perfection. It doesn't exist. So the Bible doesn't speak to that. Um, so you have to be really careful. The middle ground view. I'm trying to really plow through this, guys. Thank you for sticking with me. But the middle ground view, which is the last one I talked about, you know, it's the almost Christian experience. You're almost saved. Now, as I mentioned before, this view isn't the most popular, but I do think it's reasonable and compelling based off of what he says about himself. Now, not many people hold to this. Um, Martin Lloyd-Jones does, Terry Virgo, Adrian Warnock. It's not super popular, but it does fit in context with what Paul's been arguing the past two chapters, and it transitions really well into chapter 8. 
Unfortunately, it has the same issue that the other view has, where it's like, why is Paul talking in the first person? Why is he referring to himself? Why is it present tense? Um, however, there's another issue with this, that if this is the case, it doesn't really provide comfort to Christians who are struggling with sin. So that could be a problem with that view. So let's end by talking about the regenerate view. As I, and so this, this is, it describes our normal Christian experience, our everyday experience as Christians. Now, as I've said before, this is the most popular view. You will find this, probably most people would believe this. Um, like I said, Augustine believed it. Uh, you can look at the history of the church, John Calvin, John Owen, many of the Puritans, uh, even today, John Piper, Sinclair Ferguson, men who are way smarter than me, would believe this view. Um, so if this passage is referring to a Christian's experience, it really is a tremendous comfort to us, isn't it? And we all struggle with sin, and in fact, people who believe all these different views, everybody who, no, if you believe the unregenerate view, whatever, everyone would believe that there's this sin issue at hand. There's this war that we're waging in our flesh, and we feel hopeless save for the truth about Christ. And some may look at this passage because Paul struggled with sin as a mature Christian. They say, well, goodness sakes, thank goodness that Paul struggled with sin. He's a mature Christian. That gives me some hope. But there are problems with this view, but I want to focus on something that I think is very important. I think that, and, and I really hope that you guys hear this correctly, but I think that far too many Christians may use this passage as a platform to say, Woe is me, I just can't beat sin, I'm a horrible person. And they live in that every day. And they read this verse and they say, well, Paul felt that way, so it's okay for me to feel that way. Then they fall into despair thinking that they're in the same place that Paul was and they hopelessly cry out, you know, who's going to help me? Then they read verse 25 and they say, oh good, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. But just knowing that, just reading that text doesn't really change you when you're in that spot. It doesn't really bring about, you have to know the why. Why does he thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord? In a way, they believe that truth, but they become complacent and they feel as though that's their lot in life. I'm just a sinner. I can't do it right. I sin and I sin and I sin and I thought I was a Christian, but man, I don't know. And every day they despair and they look at this verse and they say, well, that's how Paul felt and that's the normal Christian life and sure, thanks be to God. Don't hear me wrong. I do believe that the more we mature in Christ, the more aware of sin we become. But how we respond to it and what we think about ourselves is what Romans has all been about so far. Your identity I think far too many people look at verse 25. At verse 25 of it, that's the answer. Thanks be to God, whoop de doo And that's good, but just saying thanks be to God and not dwelling on what Christ has actually done for you will not help you win the battle. These things are part of the Christian experience, but I don't believe, and this is the important distinction, I do not believe that day in and day out, we should consider ourselves captive to sin and we can't have victory over it. And so many people live this way. Yeah, I'm saved, but I am a worm. I'm the wickedest of the wicked. And they live in that every day and they can't see Romans 8, which is the answer. Romans 8 is the answer. It's not thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's good, but look at why. Read Rome. I'm gonna read the whole chapter. Okay, look at it. Look at this, I even bolded things for you so you could really see how amazing this is. There is therefore, this is true about you. You're not just this wretched sinner who can't do anything right and God just hates you and you're just miserable all the time. That's not your normal Christian life. That may be temporary, but it's not normal. This is the normal Christian life. There is therefore now no condemnation. No condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has what? set you free from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh 
in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is what? It's not this conflict of wretched man that I am and and gosh, what a mess I am and I'm defeated. What is it? The mind of the spirit is life and peace. That can be possible because of Christ in your life. The chaos of sin and feeling like you're just this miserable wretch. No, God meant for you to have a life of peace where sin is a problem, you struggle with it, but it's life and peace. For the mind that's set on God or set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Check it out. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if the, in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, This is awesome. He who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. You will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. That's true of you. For you did not receive, check this out, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are what? We are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. You're gonna be glorified. Not because of anything you've done, but because Jesus is going to glorify you because he is going to be glorified. (laughs) For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Glory is coming, guys. For the creation awaits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. In hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain, this is what we have, and they want to obtain it, the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who are the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly. We don't just drown in sin and sorrowful. We wait eagerly for something. The adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies, for in this hope we were saved. Now, hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes what he sees, but if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. When you're struggling with sin, when you're depressed, when you're sorrowful, do you think on this? The Spirit helps you in your weakness. You're not meant to just, I'm just a wretched sinner every day and I can't do it. The Spirit helps you in your weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. This is awesome too, because all of us all of us struggle with prayer. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know, look at all these, we know, that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Those are all great. And in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? And this is key. (laughs) If God is for us, who can be against us? Do you believe that? Is this just a phrase that you memorize because you want to do memory madness and whoop de doo I got it memorized. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously, undeservedly, not because of anything we've done, give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is right now for you when the devil is trying to attack you and trying to tell you that you're a wretched sinner and you can't do any good and that God hates you and you're going to live in that your whole life. He is interceding for you right now, telling the devil to stop it. 
You cannot win. I've already redeemed this person once and for all. Who shall separate us from the love of God, from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we aren't just conquerors. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else, anything else, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us, to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. For those of you who struggle every day, like I have for so long in my Christian life, with just this feeling of nothing's going to get better, wretched man that I am who will deliver me from this body of death, you're going to experience sin in your life. But do not, that is not the normal Christian life. The normal life of a Christian is enjoying this today and forevermore. And when that's the ammunition against sin. That is the ammunition against sin. It's not complacency. Paul struggled with it, so I guess I will. It is fighting sin with this. Is that not glorious? All right. I've made you guys sweat enough. Let's pray together. Lord God, I thank you so much for this text, and even though it's very confusing, and even though it can be kind of overwhelming, and and we really just scratched the surface amazingly, Lord, I am convinced that that whatever this section is talking about, what we can see, God, is that we are sinners in need of a Savior. And I'm thankful that there is more grace in Christ than there is sin in us. And so we can't save ourselves, God, thankfully. We can't sanctify ourselves, and we ultimately cannot glorify ourselves. You will do all that work. And so when sin comes at the door, Father, help us to remember Romans 8. And help us to remember that we should daily, minute by minute, Be grateful to you, as Paul says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. There is no hope except through Jesus. Help us to sing well to you, to sing to you in gratefulness. Help us to not just kind of run out the door and get on with life. Help us to really sing out of gratitude to what you've done and who you've made us to be. Thank you that you're with us in the battle for sin, to fight against sin and that there is hope before us that we can bank on from here into eternity.